Okay, our next talk is called Scalable and Secure NixOS Deploys on AWS. Let's welcome Arian. Yeah, hello. Um, my name is Arian. Um, uh, I am a NixOS maintainer working on System D stuff, cloud stuff, also on the Let's Encrypt stuff in the past. Uh, and I'm an infrastructure engineer at Mercury. Uh, and yeah, today I want to talk a bit about how we're using NixOS uh, uh, at Mercury at scale. So yeah, just for some context, um, yeah, Mercury, we are a financial services company in the US providing bank accounts for startups. And uh, it's a big Haskell app that hundreds of engineers work on, uh, which is deployed to stateless application servers running NixOS that connects to a, da a database. Um, we have a bunch of stateful supporting services like Vault, Prometheus. Uh, we also have GitHub Actions Runners, uh, a Hydra build farm. Uh, and yeah, and all our developers also use Nix shells uh, for their development. Uh, yeah, and we use NixOS to deploy multiple times per day. Um, dozens of times per day, we roll out new versions of our software stack. Um, and yeah, in this talk, I want to kind of tell about the journey from how how we do our deploys, how we change them in the past in the past years, and uh, yeah. So to talk about the status quo a year ago, um, we were uh, our system was kind of segregated into two parts. We had uh, engineers developing code on GitHub using GitHub Actions for CI. Uh, they would then merge their changes into the main branch if CI passed. And then we had an infra repo which uses Hydra uh, for NixOS builds that would watch the main branch, uh, build NixOS configurations. Um, and then uh, as soon as Hydra finished building these configurations, we pushed them over to our machines with Nix copy closure, like really standard uh, setup. So kind of like similar to NixOps or Columna or DeployRS. Uh, and yeah, those were long-lived EC2 instances that we manually add to the inventory and remove from the inventory, uh, and some hooks to like drain from the load balancer during deploys and re-add instances. But it was very bespoke and just a large bunch of bash that we wrote, basically. Uh, but yeah, the summary is Nix copy closure and CI separate from CD. Um, yeah, so we had a few issues with this deploy system. Uh, one is that we were building all our artifacts twice, like we were doing a CI build, then merge to master, and then redo the entire build in Hydra to deploy. Um, uh, also, our Hydra tracked a different Nix packages branch than our CI, uh, so that was kind of confusing for engineers. Um, also hard to track deploy status for engineers, like they were not familiar with Hydra or NixOS per se, they're just using GitHub Actions to test their Haskell app. Um, so it was very hard to know for people, when does my commit go live, how far is the deploy, um, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, and some complexity around needing to have like a bastion host to be able to SSH into our target machines and do key management for that. Um, and we didn't have a lot of automation around like doing kernel upgrades were kind of manual, like take machine out of rotation, reboot it, add it back to the cluster. Um, and also the fact that up until recently, NixOS didn't really update uh, cloud images uh, regularly. We always had to like boot up a machine, then reboot it into a new NixOS version to get like a fixed kernel and stuff. And this was also a bit manual. So yeah, we set some goals to improve this. So we wanted to empower our engineers to like have visibility and a deploy status, have faster deploys and get access to more rich deploy strategies. Uh, we wanted to reduce toil for our team. So we want to have, make it easy to add machines to our inventory for deploys, have up-to-date base images so that we don't have to do this weird dance of rebooting machines before we can deploy to them. Uh, and automate rollout of changes that require reboots, like kernel upgrades or UDEF or DBUS changes. Uh, and yeah, whilst also revisiting these things, revisits like the security properties of our deploy pipeline. So 
try to get rid of the need for a bastion host, have up-to-date images in the first place. And yeah, if rollouts are easy, then your system is also more secure. Um, yeah, so we came up with a proposed solution. Um, for the pipeline, we decided to unify everything on GitHub Actions, so CI GitHub Actions, but also CD on GitHub Actions. Um, do this from a single repository instead of an infra repo and a backend repo. Um, then we use GitHub Actions primitives like environments and branch protection rules to make sure that we can only deploy to production from the main branch and that you can only deploy to staging environments from pull requests, but not the other way around. And instead of using SSH and Bastion hosts and Nix copy closure to manage deploys, uh, we want to use like native offerings from AWS that take these concerns away from us. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so for the deploy primitives, we landed on two services that AWS provides. So for our stateless services, like the web application, um, we uh, switch to auto-scaling groups, which can take care of doing rolling releases, blue-green, canaries, rollbacks, draining of load balancers, all that jazz. And then for a handful of stateful services, where we cannot just nuke a machine and add a new one, but want to remain keep the state on the machines, we opted to use AWS Systems Manager as a replacement for our SSH-based deploys. So yeah, we had a few projects that we had to work on. So we had to like make an image build and upload automation pipeline. Pardon me, um, because there were no up-to-date cloud images for uh, for NixOS available. Uh, add auto scaling group support to NixOS and add support for uh, AWS Systems Manager to NixOS, and then hook this all together by authenticating GitHub Actions with AWS in a secure way so that we can do deploys with like temporary credentials uh, that are scoped to specific environments. Yeah, about the image builds, yeah. Traditionally, AMIs, which is what we call images in Amazon, were only uploaded once per release at the start of a NixOS release, and it was a highly manual process. And this meant that every time you boot up a NixOS machine on EC2, you would have an outdated kernel, you would have security vulnerabilities, and there was always this, you have to reboot before the machine actually is uh, like in a good state that you can use it. Uh, and the NixOS release managers had no interest in maintaining this support because there was so much toil involved. So we took the time to build a pipeline for NixOS, uh, which is now live, and it's since 24.05 uploads images for every uh, release bump automatically. And yeah, you can find it on the nixos.org website. There's like a table with all the images. Uh, you can also upload your own custom images with this upload AMI tool that we built. Uh, and yeah, that's, so that problem is now solved. We have up-to-date images and no more security vulnerabilities in our base images. So yeah, next step is how do we then use these images to do deploys, uh, and yeah, how do we make autoscaling groups work with NixOS? So what is an autoscaling group? Um, it's a fleet of instances with a common configuration called a launch template. And the launch template defines what image is being built, what are the permissions that the instance has, what is the instance type, how large is the disk, is the disk. Uh, and uh, you can also attach arbitrary user data, like tags or scripts to execute on startup. Um, then the autoscaling group uh, creates instances based on this launch template and automatically balances it across multiple data centers uh, and dis distributes traffic to these instances using a load balancer. Uh, and it will drain from the load balancer automatically when you do rollouts of, of new images, for example. So it takes care of all that, that you can just say, we have a new launch template, I want to deploy that, and then AWS takes care of rolling that out um, without any downtime. Yeah, so you can define an autoscaling group in Terraform, for example. 
You define your availability zones, what load balancers attach to scaling parameters, and the launch template. Uh, yeah, and then the launch templates you can also define in Terraform. You can define what permissions does it have, what size. Uh, for example, this launch template has access to our database and the S3 bucket. So instances spawned then get access to these services from AWS automatically. And the nice thing about launch templates is that they're immutable. So if you, if you update one, you get an immutable launch template version. And your auto-scaling group will always point to a specific version. Uh, so you can kind of think of it as like Nix profiles, but for your entire instance. So for example, our auto-scaling group is now pointing to version 1 with image 1. Uh, and then we can update it and point it to image 2, and then it will start rolling out. Uh, yeah, and the rollouts you do with this concept called an instance refresh, and uh, that is like your NixOS rebuild switch, but then for your instances, basically. And you can describe rollout strategies, uh, how much, like you can make checkpoints for canary releases, you can say how many instances do you want to cycle at the same time, do you want to outer rollback on failure. So it takes care of all these like nice things that you want in the deploy pipeline. So in our first iteration, we would build an AMI per release of our software. And that's really simple. You import the Amazon image module in NixOS. Uh, we install Nginx. And then you can just do a Nix build. You get an image out. And then you can upload it using our upload AMI tool. Um, yeah. Then you update your launch template to point to the new image. This creates a new launch template version, and then the auto scanning group starts rolling it out uh, with an instance refresh. If the machines do not come up healthy or a health check fails, it will roll back. Uh, there were some problems with this, mostly that uploading images to Amazon is very, very slow. It takes like five to 10 minutes. And it's not because of network, but just because they have like a queue, I guess, internally where they get all the image upload requests go to, and sometimes it takes a long time. And the other problem is it uses a lot of storage space. We build a new image for every release, but 95% of the image is exactly the same, right? So we, you upload two images that are each five gigabytes. Now you have 10 gigabytes of storage that you're using, even though maybe only a few hundred megabytes are actually different, which is very wasteful. So you need to have like a garbage collection solution or something. So. In our second iteration, we decided to stop using images, but instead uh, use user data to provision instances. And what this means in practice is we annotate our launch templates with the next store path that we want to deploy. So our launch template version one points to this next store path uh, and has permissions to fetch that next store path from the S3 bucket. Um, and launch template version 2 points to the new version of our web server with a different store path and also has permissions to access it. Um, yeah, and we do that by tagging our instances with the next store path that we want to deploy. And then we have a little provision.sh script, which runs on startup of the instance, downloads the next store path, and then switches, does a switch to configuration. Uh, yeah, and this is what the script looks like. like uh, instance contacts the metadata, metadata server of AWS and says, hey, what are my tags? We fetch a tag named Nix store path. Uh, we do a Nix build. And then we do a switch to configuration into that, uh, into that version. Uh, and we, use, we reboot into the new configuration to avoid issues with like Dbus not restarting, uh, UDEV rules. Uh, uh, yeah, and we package this all up in a nice Terraform module and planning to open source that. Uh, and yeah, then you just, you do a Nix build, you get your store path, you upload it to your cache, and then you do a Terraform apply. Uh, Terraform sees the store path is different and it starts an instance refresh. Uh, I'll skip through this, but because of time, but yeah, we had to step away from Terraform because it had some bugs. Um, 
and not doing instance refreshes correctly, not waiting for them to complete. So we ended up using raw commands instead, but the concept is the same. So yeah, auto scaling groups conclusion, GitHub Actions can upload a new version to S3, we update the launch template and we do a rollout. Yeah, then our stateful services. So we have some services for which this technique does not work. Like we have a Prometheus cluster and we do not just want to throw away the instance when we roll out an update because we don't want to lose the metrics for that day that are stored on disk. So this auto-scaling group approach is not a good fit. We cannot just recreate new instances from scratch and delete the old ones. Um, so we need some mechanism to upgrade in place. And uh, yeah, for that we chose AWS Systems Manager, uh, which is a service from Amazon to give you like remote access into machines and be able to send documents to these instances, which are like playbooks, like Ansible playbooks basically, that execute commands on the instance. Uh, and we started shipping this agent in the, in the AMI starting with 2405. And uh, compared to SSH, it has some benefits. Um, we do not need to open any ports or have a bastion host that has connection to all the servers. Um, the EC2 instances are able to securely connect to the Amazon SSM centralized like management server, um, even if your instances are not connected to the internet at all. Um, they use their like machine identity, like every EC2 instance has a concept of a machine identity, which is like a, a signature that says this is a valid machine and it's in this state and it uses that to register with the centralized service. So there's no SSH keys to manage, uh, no host keys to manage. And you get things like audit logging, like who executed what on what machine, when, why, uh, yeah. So how do we use that in practice? Let's say we define two Prometheus instances using Terraform and we tag them with a role Prometheus, and we have this NixOS configuration which just installs the Prometheus server. Um, then we have a thing called a SSM document, which is like a playbook, like Ansible. But in our case, the only thing the playbook does is NixOS rebuild switch. And we have a Terraform module for that. And the content of the playbook is the same as the provision script that we use for our auto-scaling groups. Fetches the config from S3, then does a uh, Nixos rebuild switch. And then the trick is we can associate a document to a group of servers using tags. And if we add new servers or remove them, they will get automatically associated with this document and SSM will keep applying it and like converge into this configuration. And then, yeah, deploys are, again, simple. We do a Nix copy to the cache, and then we do a Terraform apply. Yeah, and yeah, that's the summary of using SSM for like push-based deploys without needing SSH. The upgrades are in place, so state is preserved. Uh, and also, we, the document can also issue reboots, and then SSM will make sure that the machine only gets rebooted once, doesn't end up in a reboot loop or something. So yeah, we now have primitives for doing stateless service rollouts and stateful service rollouts. Now the question is, how do we actually authenticate from our pipeline to, to AWS to do all these things? So before we were using just SSH to deploy, now we need to communicate to the AWS API. And similarly, our instances need to have permission to fetch their closure from the cache. They need to have permissions to connect to SSM. They might have other permissions like connecting to our database or to our logging stack. Uh, and for this, we use IAM roles and IAM policies, which is service from Amazon that, that does access control for your cloud resources. And uh, yeah, a role is an identity that can be assumed by something else. So for example, GitHub Actions can assume a deploy role using its identity token. Uh, a machine can assume its instance role using its device identity document or a developer can assume a developer role using its SSO session. Uh, yeah, and these credentials are all temporary, they're rotated automatically, 
uh, credentials don't go, like requests are signed using this credential instead of going over the wire as a bearer token. So there's no, no tokens to leak. The tokens are scoped to specific permissions. It's like, it's very nice. You don't have to care about credentials anymore. Yeah, and GitHub Actions provides an ID token in every GitHub workflow, which is like a signed JWT, which tells you on which branch did the workflow run, uh, or for which environment, which repo. Um, for example, if we have a GitHub workflow that publishes to the production environment, we will get a signed JWT saying, hey, this, this workflow is destined for production. And for pull requests, we get a signed JWT saying, hey, this workflow is being run for a pull request. And then we can use these JWTs to assume an IAM role. Um, so we can configure AWS to trust the signatures from GitHub Actions and scope an IAM role to a specific uh, uh, workflow run. And then we can define a deploy role that has access to our S3 bucket and can push releases. And now suddenly our GitHub action can push deploys without having any static credentials or keys that you have to rotate. Yeah, and similar for deploys, we scope them to GitHub environments. And then we have branch protection rules that say only the main branch can push to production. Staging branch can only be pushed to from pull requests. And then we can set up a deploy policy, like you can only do deploys to auto scaling groups that have the tag production. And you can only assume this role if you are a GitHub Actions workflow that targets a production environment. And yeah, then you can use that role in your GitHub Action. So for example, here is our deploy workflow, which triggers an instance refresh. And we assume the deploy IEM role and just to give a bit of a diagram, like GitHub Actions gets a temporary credential, uh, which you then can use to access resources. This is, for example, for pushing to cache. And GitHub Actions cannot, in this case, do any deploys, but it can upload to our S3 cache in this example. So yeah, conclusion, um, we have a unified CI and CD pipeline now, which gives visibility for developers. Uh, we can do secure rollouts at scale using auto scaling groups in SSM. Uh, and we have a strong cryptographic identity using GitHub Actions ID tokens and IAM roles, which allows us to do these deploys without having to manage any secrets or credentials at all and don't have to rotate anything. And they're scoped to specific environments. Um, yeah, so that's how we currently do deploys, and it's kind of nice. Uh, yeah, if you use AWS and NixOS, come talk to me. I'm interested in talking how people are using it and maybe they want to steal some of these ideas. We have a matrix channel which is scanned this QR code for. We have the GitHub repo with the AMIs and the scripts to publish them. And the examples from this talk, I worked them out in a repo called NixCon 2024 which you can use to try out and deploy this in your own AWS account. Yeah, we have some future work ideas to make more improvements. Like we want to make a better image builder, support things like repartitioning images on, on boot up, um, things like secure boot. We have some code that we want to open source related to lifecycle hooks, which are custom scripts that you can add during rollouts of autoscaling groups. Like say we have GitHub action runner clusters. We don't want to interrupt people's jobs when we do the rollouts. So you can add a hook that says, please delay the roll rollout of this server until I'm done. And things like logging agents and stuff. Yeah, and that's all I have to tell. And yeah, thanks for listening. Any questions? Yes. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, first of all, thanks for using JWT in CI. I think everyone should do that, and not enough people are aware about these amazing capabilities. So my first uh, question is, how do you protect the cache on S3? Um, like, how do you avoid that one repository or branch is like writing illegal cache values? 
Yeah, so currently we just have one big monorepo and we have a shared cache, so we don't. Um, but you could make you could make prefixes of the S3 cache and make like more fine-grained policies and give like every repository its own cache, uh, basically. So you would make you could make an IAM role uh, that restricts people to the, you could take the repository name from the JWT, use that in your IAM role to say, this role only gives access to this subset of the S3 cache. So you can make these policies very advanced if you want to, so yeah. And my second question would be, how do you add new repos, but you have a monorepo, so. Yeah, so yeah, we have one repo, but yeah, so. Yeah, hi, also I have a question um, regarding the, how, how do you actually, uh, the, the AWS system manager, actually I have in mind when you have like a, a problem in your instance and you need to debug it and I'm not very knowledgeable about the system manager but does it uh, allow you to have like a session, like a shell or something and have longer periods of time, not just sending one command and yeah, you, yeah. So they okay. they have a shell command session that you can that is longer lived, and you can even in the AWS console you can get like a, a shell, or you can have it as a proxy command in your SSH config, and then use it to open shells. Yes, if you have the right permissions. It's, yeah. So. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so, did you have any problem deploying like using the user data? and failing somehow, like, because I can imagine if, I don't know, like if S3 reads some quota, maybe failing there uh, during the user data, is something that happens or like? Uh, so we were using Nixos Rebuild switch instead of reboot at some point. And we had like a user, like we had a Nixos Rebuild switch that would like not completely deploy the machine and it would break. And the thing what then happens is it fills the health check and the instance refresh will just roll back to the previous version and then we need to debug what happened. That's like what protects against these kind of things. Yeah. So. You just mentioned these rollbacks. Um, does it just choose the previous mm, NixOS generation or? Yeah, so we don't have multiple generations on the machine itself, but the launch templates are like you can see them as NixOS generations. So yeah, we'll have a launch template version for each NixOS generation that we ship, and it will just roll back to the previous launch template version that was successfully rolled out, yeah. All right, I'm sorry. We'll have to cut off the questions. Let's thank our speaker again.